nice to be with you. It's nice to be at Westmont again after eight years. Beautiful campus. Beautiful campus. And there's actually room on the sidewalks to walk. Don't have, you don't have that at BYU. You have people there. About 30,000 plus of them. We're delighted to be here tonight. And uh, we thought it would be sort of fun to share with you that after 13 years of, of doing this, some things we've learned, some things we've experienced, um, and maybe some lessons for all of us to be had from this experience. And so we, so we thought we'd look back for a moment or two and talk about what has this meant to us? How has it changed us? How do we see things differently now than we did in 1997? Greg, why don't you, why don't you give an illustration of something that, uh, that you've learned or an experience you've had or something that would be worthwhile? After 13 years, what have, what have you begun to pick up on? Well, let me, let me just go back a little further than that. I was talking to Dr. Enroth and his wife and Bob and I went out to dinner and I, as we came onto campus, I graduated from Westmont in 1989 and was here from 85 to 89. And I mean, uh, it's amazing when you've been, you know, 20 years graduated from a place. You can come back and it looks so familiar. And I'm, I'm actually on campus from time to time. Uh, uh, so it's, it's not like I haven't been here for, for 20 years, but uh, you come back and you just remember so many stories and moments. I can remember my freshman year, myself and another guy named Cliff were kind of known as the the guys that really did a lot of apologetics on campus. And so somehow, some way, two Mormon missionaries slipped onto campus and we were alerted because we were going to be, uh, you know, we were going to lead the charge against these two Mormon missionaries. We were going to get them and we were going to, there's going to be a, a great fight or a debate or something, you know. And so it, it turned out to be this, you know, this, uh, this really energized moment. What are you going to say when you, when you talk with them? And a lot of tension was built into that moment. And, I, I just think what's incredible is in the last 20 to 25 years, and particularly in the last 10 years, speaking as somebody who was a former Mormon, by the way, who was Mormon up to the time I was about 14, but living in Utah now almost 20 years, that, that kind of get them mentality, um, it still exists, to be sure. But I think this generation, this generation of college students over the last five or so years, five or ten years, has begun to do a lot better what maybe older generations didn't do as well, both of Mormons and evangelicals. And that is that they can look at each other first and foremost as people and just understand that in the, in the, in the pluralistic world that we live in, we have to be able to engage each other in a conversation, a dialogue of saying, okay, we live in a world of competing ideas and competing truths. We as evangelical Christians are absolutists. We believe there is one way, one truth, and one life uh, to go through Jesus Christ to the Father. Mormonism is, is considered a different worldview system, uh, but yet it claims to be a Christian worldview system. So how do we engage them? I would say, Bob, over the last 10 years, Biola students, Azusa Pacific University students, Wheaton College students, Colorado Christian University students, Fuller Seminary. Uh, Fuller Seminary, Denver Seminary, students that we've hosted in uh, Utah at Institutes of Religion, at Utah State, University of Utah, BYU, all across the Wasatch Front, the region of, of the Salt Lake area, um, are championing this idea of a new kind of interaction. Not so much debate and confrontation and hostility, but one of a thoughtful, careful, loving, respectful, yet convicted, and a doctrinal kind of relationship. And, and so I, I think that's very important. I think that's one of, the, one of the motivations that I have as a former Latter-day Saint, as a present evangelical pastor in Utah. I, I look at the connection to both communities, being a man in the middle, if you will, and I say, you know, I know that Mormons felt attacked because I felt attacked when people said, you're a Mormon, you can't be a Christian. And then, uh, and yet at the same time, I know how evangelicals honestly disagree with fundamental aspects of Mormon teaching and the story of Joseph Smith. And, and yet, if we just are fighting and arguing and debating, there's a lot of heat, but not much light. And uh, 
I think this culture in particular, this age, your age group, this generation, is much more able to do that without running to polemics and, and kind of the, the confrontational spirit. And I think, I think we're able to talk more, uh, more effectively with one another as people, Bob, and you know and I know that these friendships that have gone way beyond the visits uh, to Utah or you know, through internet or uh, Facebook or whatever, these, these students connect. There's a, a student who's just recently graduated from Brigham Young University, who's an evangelical with us tonight, and uh, she's now attending uh, Fuller Seminary, will be uh, beginning her classes down there, and she's the epitome and an example of someone engaging Mormonism as a culture in their world representing an evangelical uh, Christian understanding thing. So it's really kind of exciting. What are some things that, uh, that you think has, well, has you know, developed? To piggyback on that, I think the other thing I would, I would add is I don't know that I would have known or sensed that a more conversational, missional uh, approach to engaging someone of another faith is actually harder work. In other words, it's simpler, it's far, far simpler to jump into a conversation and make that conversation an argument or to attack another person's faith. That's easy. May I say that it doesn't, it doesn't take a lot of knowledge to do that. It doesn't take a very much effort either. It's a little tougher to know what you're talking about, yes, but to find out what the other person is talking about. I think one of the reasons people talk past one another so easily in the religious world is because they assume they already know what the other person believes and what the other person feels. And you know, that just isn't fair. That person ought to be given the right to share what they know and what they feel. And I think this, this approach, uh, this, this non-confrontational approach, is a much more difficult. But I think, I think I can say that it's far more rewarding, much more uh, fulfilling. I, I only told part of the story uh, in, the, in the video, but when that young man asked the question, he said, you know how those evangelicals are. They believe that once you've been saved, you can live any way you want to. And like I said, I, I just, one of the things that happened, and Greg, this would be something I've learned from this that I hadn't anticipated, is you begin gradually to feel a sense of responsibility for your friends, not of your faith. Um, and, and I did on that occasion, and I thought it would not be right for me to sit there and hear that comment without some measure of correction. And so I, I tried to turn it into a learning experience for the 150 of us, and I said, could you and I dialogue for just a moment and the rest of you can listen in? And he said, sure. I said, let's get back to what you were saying here. Now you say, you, you referred to this group as the, the born-againers. He said, yeah, yeah, you know what I mean. I said, I think so. I said, may I just ask you, do you, do you think the doctrine of being born again is a, is a true principle, a true doctrine, true practice? Well, yeah, sure. So you think it's scripturally sound? Yeah, of course it's in scripture. Uh, must a person be born again, I ask, to uh, enter heaven? Sure. Have you been born again? He said, I believe I have, yes. I said, wouldn't that then make you a b born againer? He said, well, I've never thought of myself as a born again. I said, well, you might want to begin thinking of yourself as a born again. It sounds to me like you're a born again. And then I said, and maybe this, this approach might be one that you'll find far more helpful. I said, could I just tighten a bit your, your description of their belief? Could I just sharpen it slightly? He said, sure. And then I went on to explain what I think we all understand, that uh, any person that's truly been saved, that has come unto Christ and given their, their heart and soul to him, will feel the need to live out their the Christian discipleship and manifest their faith by their their noble actions, their Christian conduct, their behavior, their obedience. And so you see, it, it was easy for him to jump on an idea and to throw out a caricature. Uh, 
it would have been easier still for me to let it pass and say, yeah, I know what you mean. But I couldn't do that. Why? Because I knew too many people who were evangelicals, and I've read too many hundreds of evangelical books, and I know that's how, yeah, I suppose there may be people who feel that way, but they're not right. They're wrong. And so I felt he needed to know. And so I, I think the feeling of responsibility is, is something I had not anticipated. The sense that if uh, one of my colleagues says something about my evangelical friend's faith, and it's not accurate, I, I really feel, I think I'll be held accountable before God if I don't speak up and say, I'm not so sure that's what they believe. And I would hope my evangelical friends feel the same kind of responsibility for me. You know, Bob, uh, we're going to try to tighten this up and move a little bit into a doctrinal exchange uh, to kind of model what we've always tried to model. But some, some very recent developments that are just fascinating. Um, if, if 10 or 20 years ago, um, the kind of typical engagement between Mormons and evangelicals was kind of the fight or flight mentality, you know, either fight each other or withdraw and don't have anything to do with one another. If, if there really is a growing conversation, if students and the younger generation really can engage one another in conversations of important uh, truth and, and not lose relationship, one of the real benefits is that this is beginning to be, um, it's beginning to have an impression on the senior leadership of both the evangelical world and the Mormon world. Um, as recently as this July, I, I was given a great privilege. Uh, a very famous artist passed away in Utah, 96-year-old Arnold Freeburg. You perhaps know the painting of Washington at Valley Forge, the very famous painting. It's in many Christian homes. It was uh, painted by Arnold Freeburg. He died in July, and I am a good friend of his son, who's an evangelical Christian, and he asked me to do the funeral, to officiate the funeral, and because he was a Mormon in, uh, in his background, but not actively attending, the LDS Church reached out and wanted to give him a VIP funeral and allowed his uh, funeral to be done on Temple Square, which is kind of a, kind of a dignitary uh, thing uh, for uh, the LDS Church to offer that. No doubt, I, th I think they'll probably do something for me there. I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> Kind of a VIP guy yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was strange because here you have a Mormon apostle, you know, giving a presentation. I'm officiating as an evangelical minister, and we're talking about Arnold Freeburg and, uh, and, and memorializing him. After the service, this Mormon apostle, and, and if you understand the hierarchy of the Mormon church, it's led by a prophet with two counselors and 12 additional men who are apostles. And uh, he looked at me and he said, uh, Pastor, I was very impressed with how you led this funeral service. Can we meet sometime? I'd like to get to know you better. And uh, he's 78 and I'm 43. And I said, I'd love to. Uh, let's have lunch uh, sometime when, when you're available. Well, we sat down. It's not common. Bob, it's not typically common for Mormons just to go chat with your apostles. You know, it's kind of seen as a... No, you get in a lot faster than I do. Yeah, yeah. So there, you know, uh, when, when my neighbors hear that I've had a meeting with an apostle, they're like, really wow. When I just said God opened up the door, I didn't do anything about it. But we just met in late August. And you know, we met for an hour and a half and I'm sitting with one of the Mormon apostles telling him all about what Bob and I have been doing and all about this interaction. And he's just fascinated. And I said, well, Elder Hales, could we, could we talk about one of the most important doctrinal issues between Mormons and evangelicals? He said, well, what would that be? I said, the issue of, of how we're saved. Are we saved by a combination of our good works plus what Jesus did for us on the cross? Or are we saved completely by what Jesus did for us on the cross? Is it grace alone that we're saved by, or is it grace plus works? Well, we spent about another 45 minutes having this conversation. And what we're doing, what students are doing, what scholars are doing, I think increasingly is having a kind of bottom-up effect uh, to the extent that we're having these kind of interactions next year in March, a uh, very historic opportunity for us in Utah. I serve on the board of the National Association of Evangelicals. We've been around since 1942, and for the first time in the history of the NAA, we'll be meeting in Salt Lake City for our board meetings. That brings about 80 Christian denominational leaders and parachurch leaders, and we are planning to have an official engagement with, uh, with a Mormon representative to dialogue with them about the current relationship between Mormonism and evangelicalism, where we can engage in common cause kinds of things like California's Proposition 8 battle uh, for marriage and all that kind of stuff. Where can we do that? Where can we not do that? 
uh, what kind of uh, joint ventures can we participate? Where do we draw the lines and, and show that we have to maintain the distinction? So, so some really fascinating things, Bob, that are happening and, and uh, very encouraged by. Do you, do you want to answer one quick question that I think? Uh, I have to know what it is first. I'm gonna, I'm gonna set it up for you here. Okay. The two, two of the biggest concerns that we've seen in the last 10 years is uh, agenda issues and, uh, and, and the question of compromise. The mere fact that we can be this friendly with one another can only be because you know I've compromised myself and my doctrine or you've done the same. Right. Some of your folks are a little concerned that you're not doing all that you can to convert me and vice versa. But, but the, issue, the other issue of, well the only reason that Bob Millett meets with you and the only reason Bob Millett does these presentations is because he's trying to, to get the evangelicals to think that Mormons are Christians. He, he's got this agenda, and the Mormon Church is is so wanting to be considered Christian that they'll do these kind of things just to kind of uh, you know minimize the differences and and uh, and and it's a that you have a very clear agenda. It's deceptive that you want to build this relationship because you have the genuine desire to be one accepted and to convert all the evangelicals to Mormonism. So, how do you respond to that issue of of what is the Mormon agenda? You know, vice versa, the evangelical sure. agenda. But what is the agenda, and is this a compromise? Well, it's it's a very good question. It must be a good question. It certainly comes up enough. Uh, I I I'm rather entertained by how often I have to be entertained, or I'd be pained by the number of times I'm called a liar. You know, this is this is Millet the liar. Uh, he says this publicly, but you know what he really believes. Well, I I would think that eventually what I really believe would catch up with me somewhere. Um, no, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. Greg wrestles on, on his side. He wrestles with people uh, who, who feel he's being too nice and people uh, are convinced that I'm, I'm lying and trying to present a, a Mormonism that uh, isn't the actual Mormonism. The, the problem I face with that, Greg, is pretty practical, and that is I, I work at the, at the church's flagship institution. Uh, I'm on the religion faculty. I've been the dean of that faculty. Uh, surely, if I were doctrinally wrong, somebody would have said something to me by now. Um, or if I were saying something uh, that I shouldn't say, I, I'm sure I would have been corrected by now. What I have received are nice letters, lovely phone calls, emails from church leaders and others uh, thanking us for the work we do, encouraging it, uh, to be sure, not all feel the same way, not all of my Latter-day Saint friends think I ought to be doing this, but a surprising number do. And it's not a matter of, of I suppose in some minds the purpose is to win evangelicals to Mormonism. Well, that would be perfectly fine if all evangelicals want to become Mormon, I'd be happy with that. But I'd have to say honestly, that isn't my agenda. I have one agenda, and I, and I said it in, when we were interviewed for the film. My agenda is I want to be where God wants me to be. And I want you to be where he wants you to be. And if he doesn't want you in my faith right now, then I don't want you in my faith right now. Uh, I mean that. No, no, I'm <laughs> I want to be doing what I ought to be doing. And it seems to me that in a world that's so conflicted, and in a world that's so confused, and in a world that fights uh, so often with people who are different, there's a crying need for people who have similar social, family, moral beliefs to pull together on matters that, that uh, are of great consequence to our world. It's too easy for two, two faith traditions like ours to fight each other and thus distance each other and thus let the battle be won by, by the wrong kinds of persons. I think that would be a shame. I think it would be an affront to God. And so um, I just, I guess after a while, I just roll with the punches. There are people that you know this. There are people that are going to like you and people that aren't going to like you no matter what you do or how you say it. And that's just their problem. And uh, I know what I feel, and I know what I believe, I know what I write about, uh, and so 
I think, I think you and I have had to reach the point, this is another development. I think both of us took it pretty hard in times past when, when our integrity was questioned, when our uh, agenda was, was uh, questioned. I, it still hurts a little bit, but I think we sort of roll with the punches a little better, knowing now that uh, that's just gonna come from people who, who don't care to really know what's going on. Do you think that, that currently, uh, let's, uh, let's just use this by way of illustration, Glenn Beck is someone that is appealing to a large body of American viewers. They're watching a show, they showed up in the mall. Yeah. He's a proclaimed Mormon, converted to the Mormon church about 10 years ago, but uh, he is someone that has certainly kind of uh, drawn a lot of evangelicals who are interested in his uh, charge to pray and, and, uh, and to uh, pray for our country and whatnot. If, uh, if Mormons and evangelicals were to agree on common causes, moral issues, humanitarian things, um, and even work together on those kinds of things. Um, is, it, is it assumed by Mormon people or Mormon leaders that, that if we do those kind of things, then the doctrinal issues will just be kind of uh, you know, pushed, up, pushed aside and people will just assume that Mormons are Christians because we believe in traditional marriage or sanctity of life or caring for people after disasters and, and, and we believe in God and country and those kind of things. Or is it still, is it still understood this is, that we this have is to, all one question. Yeah, yeah. We still have to understand that, that doctrine counts. It's important to understand to whom and what our understanding of God is. is how do you see that? Clearly. <laughs> um, well, you know, Glenn Beck faces the same, on a very large scale, the same challenge I face. People questioning his agenda. People wondering about his real motives. Yeah, he's a Latter-day Saint, but you know, uh, he's a human being, and he's a, he's a, I think he'd be the first to tell you, I'm a, I'm a son of God, I'm a, I'm a follower of Christ, and I'm a Latter-day Saint in that order. And uh, I don't know him personally, and I don't know his heart. I would be rather uh, shocked or surprised to learn that he's trying to rope people into Mormonism. I... I, uh, you know, I, you watch him regularly. I don't. I watch him occasionally. Um, he does some things that I really like. He says some things that really thrill me. He says some things that make me very nervous. Uh, and so I'm, I'm not as much a disciple of his as some Latter-day Saints are. But, my goodness, this is America. A man ought to be able to, or a woman ought to be able to stand up and tell how they feel and theirs is an effort to try to retrench and move back to a, a love and a respect for the Constitution and for an appreciation for the divine guidance of the founders in the settlement of this nation, the establishment of this nation. I really wish there weren't quite so many people who were always questioning someone's motives. Um, I, I don't think he has any ulterior motive. I, I know church leaders well enough to know that there are those who think he's great and there's some who aren't too excited and he's certainly not an institutional person. Do you know what I'm saying? He's a, he's a, I think the church even released a statement recently, I don't know if you've read it, but a statement indicating that, that uh, members of the LDS faith are told, get out and make a difference in society in your own way. Glenn Beck is trying to do it in his way. He certainly is entitled to that as an American and he should be given that opportunity, but he doesn't represent Mormonism or speak for us in any official way. So I don't, I don't think he has some private agenda. Uh, I don't know him personally very well. I've met him, but I don't know him personally, and I don't think he does have a private agenda. But, uh, but it, points up, it points up an interesting challenge too, Greg. Um, It's so closely related to what I was just saying, and that is the challenge we face. Yes, I mean, you, you don't want to. Clearly, I suppose you, evangelicals would love to have an evangelical president who is more than just evangelical in name. Uh, but if that's not possible, or if such a person isn't 
strong enough to win the election, you want somebody whose values, moral values, family values, social values, are in the ballpark with yours. You want a person who goes to God in prayer. You want a person who, who can feel the spirit of divine guidance in leading the nation. And you know what? Mormons want the same thing. Will a Mormon be elected president? I doubt it, but maybe. But that, that's not, you know, I don't sit and pray about a Mormon becoming president. Uh, what I do want is I want somebody to be in the office for whom we'll have great respect. A person who can rally the nation and pull the people together and, and speak a voice that, that, that uh, brings respect and admiration and to whom we can look once again and feel good about. And so, I don't think he has a private agenda, but I do think it's sad that so many people who have similar moral values would be on some campaign or crusade to prove that he does. Because in the long run, they may just shoot their own foot off politically. Interesting, okay, so shoot a question my way that you think an average Mormon might ask an average evangelical yeah. uh, to either prove their church to be true against ours or that they really struggle with? What would you think is a, a typical doctrinal issue that we would disagree on from a Mormon perspective? Okay. The issue of authority is a big issue with Latter-day Saints. I, I think there are a lot of Latter-day Saints who would read the book of Acts, particularly the first, oh, I don't know, uh, eight chapters and wonder how a, a body of people could suppose that there is no need for the kind of apostolic authority that came by the laying on of hands practiced in the New Testament. In other words, I think Mormons would question that dimension of Protestantism. While we do not accept Roman Catholicism as the correct brand of Christianity, at least they believe in a form of descent of apostolic succession down through the popes. Protestantism doesn't have that. How can, I guess I, guess, I guess I would say this, I'd be interested in, in your reply to the question of how Protestants can have a leg to stand on, how you can on the one hand say we trace our Christianity back to the beginning and yet you break the line of authority with the Catholic Church. Is that all one question? Yeah, because we, uh, we talk about that a lot uh, in relationship to your typical Mormon missionaries coming to uh, a door and, and kind of asking the question, you know, where do you get your authority to be a true Christian church? And you, you make a direct claim that Joseph Smith got that authority from God in Revelation. Apostolic authority from Peter, James, and John. And that it was a restoration of something that had been lost roughly about the first century uh, when the apostasy kind of began. Um, I, uh, we, can, we can certainly look both historically and, and how modern day evangelicalism kind of uh, deals with the question of, of ecclesiology and, and what defines church authority. Uh, most Christians at a lay level, I think Bob would go right to Jesus Christ and understand that when he commissioned his disciples in Matthew 28, uh, as evangelicals want to always kind of come back to the Bible as the basis of our faith and our practice, we would say that Jesus Christ told his disciples in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, that all authority in heaven and on earth was his, given to him by his Father in heaven, and that he imparted that authority to his disciples. And that they were to take that authority and go and preach and teach and baptize people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The author John, in the book of Revelation, calls Christians, um, he tells us that we are kings and priests unto our God. The book of Hebrews talks quite a bit about the issue of authority, priesthood, and the role of Jesus Christ as our great high priest. So we have that as our starting point of understanding that our authority, we believe, comes directly from Jesus Christ 
and that when you become a Christian and the Holy Spirit comes into your life, you have the presence of, of God in you to live for him, to serve him, and then to uh, engage others with the truth of Jesus Christ. It's do telling you, that story. Do you believe that the apostles, let's take Peter and the original 12, did they have something besides the Holy Spirit given to them as apostles by Jesus that made them apostles and that therefore um, authorized them to cast out even spirits, uh, you just see you just see constant reference to the laying out of hands to but you know you, authority. you see that in the book of Acts as Christianity is formalizing itself but you don't see it in the early pages of the gospel where Jesus calls his original 12 he just simply goes up to these guys and says come follow me and there's this partnership of relationship and if, if you're to ask the question from the perspective of our history obviously there was a great break between the movement called Protestantism and Catholicism in the 1500s, where Martin Luther and, and company rejected this formal uh, authority structure and said there shouldn't be this kind of this this break between men, humanity, and God. We should have direct access. Hebrews 4:6, 4, 6, uh, 4, 16 says that we can come boldly before the throne of Hebrews 4:6 uh, that we can come boldly before the throne of God and petition Him in times of need. So Luther says, there should be a priesthood of all believers. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you have the authority to not only believe in him, but be empowered by him to serve. And of course, in our Protestant world today, we have different ecclesiologies, different church communities, some that are very structured, and high church we call them, and they have a, a kind of an ecclesiastical uh, organization. Some are very casual and very uh, contemporary, if you will. But I would say, we, we obviously don't have what the Mormon church has. We don't have a prophet who's a head of our church. We don't have an authority structure called the Mormon priesthood. And, uh, and yet I don't, I don't personally see some historical or biblical passage that requires it um, as much as I do see that each Christian is authorized, given the authority. I love the verse in John chapter 1 verse 12. To them that believed on his name, to them he gave them the right, that's the Greek word for authority, the right to um, believe on his name and become the sons of God. So, so here we have a sense where we as Protestants believe our authority comes directly from our relationship with Jesus Christ and being filled with the Holy Spirit. We would, we would be a little confused that Mormons trust in a kind of a, an organizational structure or a hierarchy that we would say, fine, that's not what would, we would call you not Christians for, but that you've mandated it and said it has to be just like this, that's where we would disagree, um, I think. And, and so it's interesting, when Joseph Smith comes on the scene in 1820 and receives this revelation that he says he received, he's told that all of Christianity is an abomination, or the creeds, their creeds are an abomination and their hearts are far, far, far from you. And consequently, there needs to be an abandonment of, of anything recognized as Christianity on the planet then to something that is restored well, actually, and brand that's, new. That's an overstatement. Okay. He doesn't, doesn't say that. He says, he says, no, they're all wrong. Their creeds are an abomination in my sight. I was told to join none of them. Right. Um, but that the day would come when I would be the means through which the church would be restored. So it wasn't, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, a wholesale denunciation of all Christian peoples, but there was some serious concern about creedalism, about the creeds. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. so I know we haven't solved that one, but that's a big one between us. Okay, the Mormon Church has this claim that it is the unique authority-bearing authority-bearing church on the face of the earth. And so, let me ask you this question: okay. as a flip-flop, how then can can the Mormon Church claim to be a Christian church and part of the larger Christian community when it sees itself as the only true church and and says that the Protestants, the Catholics, and the Orthodox Christians of the world today, they have a form of godliness, they have a form of truth, they have a kind of truth, but not the full truth. How how do you honestly, you can call us Christians in that kind of generic sense of word, but are we fully Christians? At, I mean, are we brothers and sisters in Christ in the fullest way from the Mormon perspective? Or 
aren't we still kind of insufficient as, as non-Latter-day Saints? Good question. Well, um, you, you see what this gets at, Greg. This, this really gets at a hard issue. It gets at the matter of definition, right? It's what is the definition for a Christian? And, and I think maybe even more important, and, and who has been appointed to so designate? In other words, who's responsible for making that? Who's the decision maker? Is it about theology? Is it about authority? Is it about practice? I guess we, have, we as, as Mormons have always been pretty content to refer to people who believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and basically accept the New Testament story as a Christian, okay? Now that's a follower of Christ. Uh, we, have, we have never made the discrimination based upon theology per se as to whether a person is Christian. Because we recognize that in the, the larger Christian world, there are differences among, among various Christian groups as to what they believe about this or that theological point. So for us, the definition is, is one who is a follower of Christ. Now your question as to only true church and how then do we view the other the other the other groups that uh, the more traditional Christians. Well, only true church really in the long run gets down to this, authority bearing institution, which what we just talked about. Mm -hmm. Neil Maxwell, one of the apostles that passed away several years ago made that point. He said, by that we mean that Latter-day Saints are the only authority bearing organization on earth. And so for us, the authority is the big issue. Um, and we wouldn't, again, we wouldn't say a person is not a Christian because they believe in the Trinity and we don't. And so I, you're, you're less prone to see Latter-day Saints, not somebody, that, not a Latter-day Saint that knows very much, denouncing everyone else as non-Christian. Because when a person says to me, yeah, well, you believe you're the only true church and therefore we're not Christian. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying... We believe we have authority to officiate, apostolic authority to officiate in the name of God. That doesn't mean that we denounce the rest of Christianity. I think it's been an oversimplification on the part of many Mormons in the past to say, essentially, the lights went out in 18, excuse me, in 100 AD and didn't come on again until 1820. Well, that's a lovely thought, but that's a, that's a really oversimplistic way of looking at things because Clearly, God has his hand involved in many things through the centuries. Do you think the average Mormon thinks that or, or not? Well, they, I, don't, I can't speak for the average Mormon. I'm, I'm not. Uh, You're not Joe maybe the Plumber? I'm average. I don't know. Joe the Mormon? Joe the Mormon. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, do they? Maybe. But if they do, it's not well thought through. I don't see our leaders talking that way. And I think you'd know from some of the general conference addresses just in the last 10 years a surprising number talking about such things as the Spirit of God continuing upon the heads and hearts of men and women through the centuries and how guided, how God guided and uh, preserved the scriptures, the Bible, through these noble men and women. And so, do I believe Christianity was lost from the earth? No. Do I believe authority was lost? I do. Okay, another quick question. We've got time maybe, for maybe... Did I ask you one? Yeah. We've got time for... One, and then we need to say something quick. Okay. The future. We're, we've been asked to prophesy, and so we'll do that in just a few minutes. So, so don't leave. Um, it's going to be like a Mount Carmel moment. <laughs> He's going to get his chance, and I'm going to get my chance. <laughs> Who's ever God who shows up, they will know. They have a lot of water here, too. To Question. Get those, get those buckets filled up, would you? <laughs> question, Greg. Um, it seems to me... Are you going to come up with a question? I'm th while, I, while I'm talking, I'm thinking of one. Yeah. Now, it seems to me that one of the big issues between us, cl clearly, I don't know, maybe the big issue between us has to do with the nature of God. Mm -hmm. um, I find I'd be interested in your response to this. When a person says to me, you can't be a Christian because you don't believe in the true Jesus, 
Now, my reply is, I believe in the Christ as, as made known in the New Testament. I spoke to a, a friend who was visiting from a friend of ours who's a professor at uh, Southern Baptist in Louisville uh, Seminary. And uh, his reply was, no. I, I said, I believe in the Christ as made known in the four Gospels and in the rest of the New Testament. Am I not a Christian? He says, no, you must be a person who believes in the Christ as made known through the four Gospels and the rest of the New Testament and as set forth in the post-New Testament church councils. Now, to me, that's hardly what Martin Luther would call sola scriptura, scripture alone. If we were scripture alone, then Mormons would be the first to say, look, I believe in the Christ of the four Gospels. I believe in the Jesus as made known there. No, I don't believe in the Christ as made known in 325, in 384, in 430 AD. Comment? There was a question, wasn't there? Yeah, there was. Um, and, it, and you obviously know that in a presentation confined within an hour or so, we are just, you know, lightly touching these uh, responses. And yet, hopefully, you, you can sense. And long before there was ever a Bob and Greg dialogue, there was a Bob and Greg dialogue. Bob and Greg meeting at the um, soup and salad place right on University Parkway, you know, about every month. We were very skinny when this started, I promise. I weighed 135. Uh, um, I was six. So we had a lot of salad, and I think it was that dressing and some of that <laughs> stuff that we put on it. But, but we would talk just like this for hours about the Trinity, about the nature of the Mormon view of God, about salvation by grace or by works, about scripture, could it be additional things beyond the Bible, about the nature of sin and heaven and hell, heaven and hell, all these things. I mean, we once had a phenomenal conversation <laughs> on the top of a uh, Boston uh, hotel complex, which we later learned was a bar. It really was a bar. And we were in the corner talking about the Trinity. <laughs> Nobody else in that bar was talking about the Trinity, I can guarantee you that. <laughs> We found ourselves, but that's that's the nature of this. This is not pretend or just for show. Having said that, Bob, I think that you follow my question, Greg. It's, yeah. it, to me, it's it's a decent question that I think Mormons can ask, which is, if you hold to Scripture alone, why the necessary, well, and as revealed through, made known through, Nicaea? Because obviously. A movement is defined by a broader sense that even as we say sola scriptura, we have a history. And and I don't I'm not trying to be unkind here, but you know, there are fundamentalist Mormons who claim that you folks have gone astray from the original days and they call themselves Mormons and you kinda go, But you're not Mormons. You're you're wacko guys, you know, you believe in things that we don't believe in and we never believed in. And they say, yes, we did. And so you have that tension between some of your distant cousins and and your... Cousins your, a little close, but go ahead. Okay, your, your, your relatives or whatever. Because you, you're saying that somehow they're not consistent with what real Mormonism teaches. Mm -hmm. So in a like kind of example, we're saying as modern day Protestants and, and Christians, that Mormonism comes along in 1830 and says, those things which you have believed for 2,000 years are significantly flawed. And this is the true understanding of things. So we believe, I mean, I don't know of a, a Bible scholar, a professor of religion, a Christian pastor, who would say that, that the Bible alone is not sufficient for their knowledge of who God is, of who Jesus is, and the whole sense of what Christianity teaches that we draw it from there. But obviously uh, formulating the nature of God is, is both a scriptural uh, study and an understanding that is kind of uh, uh, added on and, and grown and developed through the history of our scholarship, the creeds, the creedal periods as Christianity was being debated in, in the first centuries. So we say that we do believe that God is both unity and diversity. He is unity in that he is one, monotheistic, and yet he is 
diversity in that he is Father, Son, and Spirit. And we believe that the Trinity, while not a word of the New Testament, best explains the relationship of the members of the Godhead that is one God. Now Mormonism comes along and says, well, that's nonsense because there's three gods there, so why don't you just admit that we believe that God the Father is a God, God the Son is a God, and God the Holy Spirit is a God, and you at least have three. And you, while you're saying that, you're not thinking that you're some polytheistic Greek religion, but you, you look at it that way. I would say that our understanding of God's nature is founded in, primarily understood through what we believe the New Testament, the Old Testament combined, gives us to understand who God is. And that, um, that the further development or the further understanding, the 2,000 year history, the tradition of the church, the teaching of the church, has, bring, has brought clarity to where Christianity has to be defined by something, some primary doctrine, some primary fundamentals of the faith. And you'll find this, Bob, across the Christian world, Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant, that those fundamental understandings of what does it mean to be a Christian is that you do have to affirm, as Travis Kearns was offering you as, a, as kind of a requirement, to believe that there is an understanding of who God is, of who Jesus is, of what scripture is, of what it means to be saved, about the condition of humanity, the lordship of Jesus Christ, that if you don't believe it correctly or accurately, or as we would say, biblically and with the explanation of the church, then that would be something other than Christianity. Would that be the case then with the Christians who lived during the first 100 years? No, because, because we, would, we would say they had the testimony of Christ, the understanding of the Holy Spirit, and certainly the church grew. I mean, the church developed with understanding, with pastors, with leaders, with scholars, writing over 2,000 years. We have a body of literature, a body of history, a body of teaching, mistakes, failures, debates, if you will, that bring to what we believe is an, an understanding of the biblical teachings. Those Do you think, though, that the, the, first, the first apostles or the first Christians that, let's say, the, the, the 8,000 that were baptized into the faith in the first few chapters of Acts, did they possess a knowledge of the Trinity? Fair question, and we've, we've batted this around. Um, we certainly, we believe that we see that in Jesus' statements to his own disciples. They say, show us the Father and we'll believe. And he says, I've told you before, if you see me, you've seen the Father, and the Father and I are one. So we believe that, that the, the, the teaching and the early instruction of Christianity was that God was one, but God expressed himself in this relationship with Father and Son. Now, I understand from your perspective that it can be looked back on and seen as a kind of you know, a supplement or an addition that is man's understanding upon scripture and that Mormons claim that they're, they're abandoning any of those creeds and any of those developed theology for just, for just the, the teachings of the Bible. But clearly even, even Mormonism defers to Joseph Smith's revelation and authority to bring knowledge or ideas about God that we don't find in scripture. Sure, it, but you, you can see that, that before long, and we can, we can close off with this, you can see that it does get back to definition. And you say, well, if, if, if the defining point is any person who doesn't profess, who doesn't understand and profess an acceptance of the Trinitarian formulation of the Godhead, couldn't really be considered a traditional Christian. And my question was, do we really believe that the early Christians, the early saints of the first 100 years understood that? I think it would be hard to defend that. But, that, but that's the kind of questions that... Clearly, as primitive people, as, as a growing movement, this theology wasn't clearly understood yeah. and broadly known. We didn't have this all thought through, but I do think that, again, the, the issue that we're facing on this whole label thing, this whole issue thing, is that Mormonism emerges in 1820 and 1830 and says everything, you know, uh, that there's significant flaws in what Christianity is, there's a restoration. So from that point on, the claim is who has the right authority to be truly Christian? Agreed. Again, I know I, we haven't solved this one, and our friends out here are just hearing us kind of go back and forth. Yeah. I hope that they'll have these kind of conversations with their peers and their friends and say, okay, 
What do you as a Latter-day Saint believe about that? How does this work for you? You have a wish. If you had your wish 20 years from now, where would the relationship between evangelicalism and Mormonism be? Well, I've made it very clear to you that if I had to really put my cards on the table with your church's leadership, with you, and with every Mormon I know, um, you know, the primary and most deep-seated passion of my life is that Mormons would have a relationship with Jesus Christ that understands that through the grace of Jesus Christ, which is very Book of Mormon-ish, language-ish, is the way in which they can be rightly connected to God. That it's not a relationship of doing my best and proving to God that I've done all that I need to do, or at least most of what I need to do to get into heaven. I was raised as a Latter-day Saint thinking that my best effort was kind of added on to whatever Jesus did for me, and then hopefully, maybe I might actually make it. I would say as a primary goal of this whole conversation with me, and I know that you and I have experienced a lot of very satisfying conversation about what does it mean to have a right relationship with Jesus Christ? What does it mean to know him, to be born again, to know his grace, and to know his mercy? I wish a lot of Mormons and a lot of evangelicals could have that conversation and not be uncomfortable with it and not kind of take these opposite extreme positions, but that, that we would see together that truly it is the grace of God that changes us to do good works that are affirmations. And Glenn Beck, you know, I'll just say it bluntly. He, he seems, guy to, seems seem to believe to that, doesn't he? He seems to talk that way. Uh, uh, and so I really feel that there are certainly all kinds of things I'd like to see. I'd like to see the Mormon church wholesale, you know, embrace uh, Trinitarianism and, and uh, scripture, you know, the Bible alone and scripture. But honestly, Bob, most of my heart goes out to my Mormon friends who feel like they have to hope that they've been good enough. I know that's not something you see or believe is, is, is the way the Mormons all think, but a lot of Mormons that I know do seem to think that way. I would agree with you that a lot of Mormons do think that way, and I would hope in 20 years that they would have uh, changed that too. I, I see, I mean, I would love to see the day 20 years from now when, when we could actually have civil occasions to come together as Latter-day Saints and as evangelicals and to sit down and have uh, great uh, Bible studies. Oh, yeah. I'd love to see us more and more often gather together and talk about the Book of Romans. I'd love to see us come together not compromising a whit of what we believe, not a piece, but uh, without defensiveness, but in a spirit of eagerness to know, well, okay, you're reading this, I'm gonna help me understand as an evangelical how you would view this, and I'll share with you how I view it. And we're not gonna agree on that, but I, I wanna know where you're coming from. Because I think that's when you really get to know a person well, is when, I mean, the reason I know him well, I think I could count him my best friend, uh, other than my wife, is to say, We've done this because we've, we've talked about things that are deep down in our hearts. Boy, I long for the day when people can do that without defensiveness, still holding tight to their, to their personal beliefs, but do so without rancor, without condescension, without uh, feeling that they're somehow compromising their soul uh, by, by, by get, getting into a, a serious gospel discussion. I, mean, I long for the day when we can do that. And I think that's reasonable. I think that's reachable. Um, I, I love that idea. I think uh, we, we, know, uh, we know a friend, Dr. Uh, J.I. Packer, who would like to see Catholics and Protestants get together in Bible studies to talk about what the Bible has to say about various doctrines. And yep. I think that would be great. We can... Uh,